Our guest uh, this evening, Professor Bard O'Neill, is uh, Director of Middle East Studies and Director of Insurgency and Revolution Studies at the National War College. Uh, he's an expert in the Middle East. He's written several books and numerous articles. And let me just remind you of the uh, uh, relevance of the topics. Uh, the energy crisis in U.S. foreign policy, insurgency in the modern world, armed struggle in Palestine, insurgency and terrorism, articles including the Intifada in the context of uh, armed struggle, the United States in the Middle East, Israeli defense policy, an analysis of the Persian Gulf War, the impact of Israeli and Palestinian rejectionism, topics all of which are central to this evening's discussion, of course and uh, provide the grounding for it. He served as a consultant to various U.S. government agencies, the Department of Defense, the, chair, the, the uh, Chairman, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, NSA, the CIA, National uh, Defense Agency. And you, many of you have seen him uh, interviewed as a, uh, an authority on CNN, C-SPAN, and other uh, national and international networks. In, in short, uh, Professor O'Neill uh, is a very distinguished authority. Uh, we're delighted that he's joining us to discuss what is, has become a, a central part of American foreign policy, the matter of dealing with, uh, with terrorism. So it's my great pleasure to present to you Dr. Bard E. O'Neill. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I, as a Baltimore Oriole fan of long standing, I must tell you, it's a great pleasure to be in Baltimore. There will be better times ahead for that. <laughs> it really is nice to be here, and I see an old friend and colleague, very respected colleague, Bob Friedman here, uh, and it's a real delight. I'm glad he's come up here. Uh, what I think I will do is spend about a half an hour sketching out the context of American national security policy in the Middle East to include the issue of terrorism, and then leave time available for you to address any particular concerns that you might have. And there are many concerns when it comes to the Middle East. A little over a year ago, the President identified terrorism, which we define as the use of physical coercion against noncombatants, especially civilians, to create fear in order to achieve political objectives. He defined that as the most important national security problem that we will face going into the next century. So we have truly a transmillennial issue. And if you look around the world, there is plenty to be concerned about. It is a daunting prospect to realize that at some point in the future, a small group of people might have the capability to inflict more casualties than the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac did during the Civil War. And this is essentially because of the advent of weapons of mass destruction or selective destruction, which we will come back to. We don't need to be hysterical or alarmist about these. We can readily agree that the possibility of these weapons being used may be low. But on the other hand, if they are used, the consequences will be extremely high. And for that reason alone, we need to prevent this from happening. It will do no good in the city of Baltimore or anywhere else to have a catastrophic event and then begin the post-mortems regarding who did what wrong. So this is a serious problem even though there may be a low possibility. Having said that, let's take a step back and try to put the issue of terrorism and the Middle East in a broader context and thereby set the stage for discussion this evening. The best place to start is where we always need to start, American national interest. It is surely the case that in certain areas of the world and with respect to specific countries, the United States has at best peripheral interest. The question is, does the United States have national interest in the Middle East and how important are they? I think it's safe to say that the United States has vital economic interest in the Middle East. Our standard of living, our economic well-being, for good or for bad, will continue to depend on access to Middle Eastern oil. And it doesn't make any difference that we are currently living with a glut and we're paying 97 cents a gallon for oil as we fill up our cars. The public 
and the private prognostications are clear. And this is despite what's going on in the Caspian area. As we go into the next century, given our consumption patterns and where we think our economy will hopefully be, the United States and the West will continue to be dependent and may be more dependent than ever on Persian Gulf oil. So the Persian Gulf will remain an area of central importance to the United States. We have vital economic interest. We also have major security interest. Defining security today is very difficult. During the Cold War, we could do this in somewhat quantitative terms vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is gone. The threats have become more diffuse. And we have to engage in lots of activities to cope with diffuse threats. That in turn means we have to maintain a reasonable level of military capability. That in turn means we need to maintain a strong and healthy economy, especially in the area of cybernetics. All of this means, once again, that Middle Eastern oil is important. If we have, hypothetically, a major oil crisis sometime, say, early in the next century, that will lead to operational cutbacks and perhaps even cutbacks in defense spending when it comes to essential industries, which will lead to an erosion of military capability. And I don't have to tell you, and you don't have to be a salesman for the Department of Defense, we are asking our young people to go lots of places today to engage in lots of things that have to do with keeping peace, not fighting wars. Our military is really stretched across the board. So our capability is not as great as you might think when you take into consideration the stretching of that capability, all of which means that a major oil crisis in the Gulf, which undermines that capability, is not something we would welcome. So it is the capability to deal with various kinds of problems in an effective way that we are talking about. And one of those problems, quite obviously, given the role of the military, would be to deal with armed conflict, be it on the Korean Peninsula, be it at some future point in time with China, hypothetically, you name it. You can conjure up situations as well as I can, and we had better be ready to deal with those situations. So we're once again thrown back on the Middle East. What happens there in terms of petroleum can surely undermine our economic capability and thus our military capability in the long term. There is also another issue here that relates to security. And it's that psychological dimension known as credibility. What do people believe you will do? Do your adversaries believe you will act? Saddam Hussein didn't in 1990. Do your friends believe that you will act? Very often people engage in certain types of behavior because they simply don't believe in what you say. Where does that issue come into play in the Middle East? That aspect of capability comes into play with respect to American connections to Saudi Arabia and to Israel. We have pledged to support their security. With regard to Israel, it has been stated time and again since President Truman. So whether or not you think that's wise, unwise, good or bad, makes no difference. America's word is on the line. Its credibility is on the line. And what we do or don't do will be watched across the world. See, the United States finds that it has vital economic interest and major security interests wrapped up in its policy in the Middle East. What kinds of long-term goals are logically derived from that calculation of the national interest? The first and paramount goal that we pursue in the Middle East is to assure adequate supplies of petroleum at reasonable prices. This was not the case prior to 1973. It is the case now and has been since about 1975. A second goal is to foster stability, that is to say nonviolent change in the Middle East, especially when it comes to our friends in the Middle East. The third goal is to prevent any power that is hostile to American interest from gaining hegemony in the Middle East, controlling influence in the Middle East. It is that third goal from which the specific policy of dual containment is derived. A fourth goal is to assure the survival of the State of Israel within its 1967 borders. We have differences with the State of Israel over its continued occupation in the West Bank and in the Golan Heights, and specifically with regard to Jerusalem. That's something we can talk about if you would like. And a final long-term goal is to arrive at a durable Arab-Israeli peace settlement. 
These are long-term goals. I need not tell you they're challenging goals, and we need to pursue them with great patience and determination. But as we do that, we face obstacles, obstacles that not only make it difficult to achieve the goals, but obstacles that give rise to the violence, specifically terrorism. And what we're really talking about are the long-standing characteristics of the Middle Eastern social political scene that are behind the headlines when it comes to specific events. Let's talk about those in a very sketchy, brief way. First of all, we need to come to grips with the fact that if we look at a map of the Middle East and see countries in different colors, that's just what they are. They are countries. They are not homogenous nation states, more or less, of the sort that we see in Western Europe, Japan, the United States. Rather, most of these countries are divided within, on religious grounds, ethnic grounds, tribal grounds. Divisiveness is the order of the day in the Middle East, not cohesiveness. So one of the great challenges for the leaders in the Middle East is to try to build a cohesive society. The fact that there is a lack of national cohesion leads to violence. The way you play the game in the Middle East, if you're smart, is not to march an army across a border, but to look across that border, look at your neighbor that you're having a dispute with, and find out what groups inside his border challenge him, and then you support those groups against him. That is the most prevalent modus operandi in the Middle East, without any question. And when you support these groups that are in opposition across borders, almost inevitably, it will involve terrorism violent attacks against civilians. Sometimes that's mixed in with guerrilla warfare. But that is the way you conduct business. And so it is the Syrians who want a specific, clear agreement with Turkey on Euphrates waters have, in their frustration, turned to support for the PKK, the Armenians, Devsol, any number of groups that inside Turkey are considered to be divisive forces, the most important of which would be the Kurds taking advantage of the other side's internal weaknesses. This is the way you play it in the Middle East. A lack of national cohesion also complicates attempts to resolve conflicts. Take a quick example. LBJ used to say, can't we sit down and reason together? Well, let's take that nice homespun American philosophy and apply it to negotiations over the Golan Heights. Why don't we sit down and carve it up and have half a loaf? Reasonable men can do this until you begin to look at the predicament on both sides. But I'll focus just on the Syrian side. There are a number of factors that always lead to leaders adopting certain courses of action. And I won't go all through the factors that probably lie behind Hafez al-Assad's foreign policy making. But one that we dare not leave out is the fact that he is from a minority group known as the Alawites, which constitute probably 10% of the population. They are people from the mountains who are despised by the Sunni majority. And when you look at the Sunni majority within that community, there is a small segment that is very militant. Militant to the point of creating great instability in the 1970s. Militant to the point of carrying out many acts of terrorism. Militant to the point where it led Hafez al-Assad to roll the artillery up and kill anywhere between 10 to 30,000 people with artillery in the late 1970s in the city of Hama. How do you resolve the issue of terrorism when people are so divided. In this case, it's a religious divide. Well, you could go across the Middle East. We could talk about Jordan and the perils of peacemaking based on tribalism and tribal affiliation. Sunni Shi'i is a major issue throughout the Middle East. Regardless of what my Arab friends will say, on the one hand, you know, they dismiss it. And then they will soon come back to it and say, aha, but so-and-so is a Sunni or so-and-so is a Shi'i and so on and so forth. Countries are divided from within. And this gives the opportunity for people to fish in troubled waters and to engage in acts of terrorism, and it makes it difficult to resolve conflicts. A second problem, which is equally important, is what I would call the dysfunctional effects of social change. The Middle East is an area that is undergoing rapid social change. Millions of people are moving in from the deserts and from the village areas into the cities, but the cities cannot sustain them. The services are not there. There's overcrowding, lack of housing, lack of medicine, lack of schools, you name it. And yet people have great expectations. But who are the people who seem to have the greatest expectations? They're the young people. 
A rough ballpark figure is that something like 50% or more of the people in the Middle East are under age 15. When you get up to age 28, it's more or less about 70%. And what we must realize is that these people, many of them, have been told that there is a future, there is a better life. And so if you're a youngster in the Middle East, you dream of getting married someday, having an apartment, having a car, having good schools for your children. This is the dream. Where does the dream come from? The dream comes from your leaders who promise it. The dream comes first from the radio, but in more recent times from television. They can look at the Inner Harbor on television and say, boy, this is the way to live. This is what I want for my future. But there is something that comes with that dream, and that is a compromise with your past, with your tradition, with your roots. Maybe you don't fast during Ramadan or you cheat on the fast. Maybe you don't pray five times a day. In other words, maybe you compromise your Islamic beliefs, all in the quest for that great material utopia that stands out there. Until one day you wake up and realize you have no hope. What you are doing if you're a young Algerian is standing on the streets of Algiers selling cigarettes. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence, and then we have the aggregate sociological commentaries by Saad Ibrahim and others, which point to disillusionment, frustration, translating into anger. And what is this about? What we find is that the sociologists and the psychologists detect what they call individual and collective identity crises. People don't know who they are. Am I a good practicing Muslim or am I a person of the West? Or am I caught right now in these existential circumstances in the middle? And I can't tell you who I am. I can't tell you what my roots are. I don't know what my future is. And I can tell you this, I'm angry. Some of those who feel this way will find their way into militant organizations and would be all too willing to engage in acts of terrorism. So terrorism can be born, first of all, from lack of national cohesion, depending on what group you're in. Secondly, because of these problems that are generated by the rapidity of social change, its dysfunctional effects, and the failures of leaders in the Middle East to paint a hopeful future. A third problem is economic regression and stagnation. In many places, things are dead in the water, but probably in most places, they're going backward. Growth rates of maybe 10 years ago, which looked hopeful here and there, were actually very misleading because they were based on direct or indirect oil money. But those days are over, at least for now. And so as we look at these economies and we peel away the layers, we see entrenched structural problems, profound problems. You don't have enough entrepreneurs. There are too many people. They don't have the right education. Outside capital is not being invested in the Middle East for obvious reasons. It's too unstable. There are cultural barriers. And on and on the list goes. And we find out that it is a bleak future the one we see in front of the Middle East when it comes to economics. And I think if you go along with me on this, you can see these things starting to interconnect and reinforce. A fourth factor is corruption. Corruption is pretty much endemic. And we're not talking about functional corruption, tolerable corruption. We're talking about intolerable corruption. Five years ago, if I were to stand up where I teach, where we happen to have international fellows who are generals and colonels in the militaries around the world and mention corruption, you could almost guarantee that my Arab friends would stand up and go into a state of denial and tell me this isn't so. But about three years ago or so, I had occasion to discuss this. And the first people to jump up and say, amen, you're right, we've got to deal with this, were the Arab officers. And what I heard from them in private was, we've had it. We've had it with these privileged ruling groups. How come they'd had it? They've had it because of the economic squeeze. Times have gotten tougher. Corruption is not as well, or is not as tolerated. I could take you just to a file drawer in my office, and I find it interesting to collect stuff on this and give you Middle Eastern sources, which, by the way, provide 99% of what I'm saying today. It's based on middle, what the Middle Easterners say, not what Westerners say about the Middle East. They will tell you, country by country by country, Corruption is a major problem. It's got to be addressed. It is even a problem in the new Palestine National Authority. Absolutely predictable, absolutely predictable, before that authority was set up, that they would act that way. And so what we're finding is, therefore, the Palestine National Authority finds it very hard to function effectively, in part,
because of corruption, which is connected to lack of viable economic programs, which is connected to political uh, institutions being simply stillborn. But corruption is everywhere, a huge problem. And it becomes less acceptable when times are tough, which they are. And then we have the issue of political participation. Not participation in the American sense. Not participation in an Australian or United Kingdom sense. We're talking about participation maybe within the context of an essentially authoritarian or low authoritarian system. But a desire by people like you, people like me, to participate and have some say in decisions. So we're talking about a growing professional middle class that wants to have some type of an impact. Yes, they will accept authoritarian politics, but they want to be heard. Some of you can be co-opted, and regimes do that, but others are not co-opted. There's not enough to go around. And you become, under those circumstances, the most dangerous people of all, believe me, because you provide the leadership, you provide the ideas, you provide the skills, and you provide the organization to take advantage of all these problems. None of these problems I talked about, lack of national cohesion, economic stagnation and regression, dysfunctional effects of social change, corruption, none of these in and of themselves are going to lead to violence. It's when people with ideas and organizational skills come along to seize the day, which is exactly what the leaders of the militant organizations in many cases are able to do. They come into these very troubled waters and they provide hope for the future. And they create organizations that underscore that hope. These then are the problems in the Middle East. These have been there for a long time, and in many cases, they're getting worse. The major source, but not the only source, of violence in the Middle East now, as far as potential implications for American interests are concerned, are the militant Islamic organizations. But let's pause for a moment and make it clear. We all know that most Muslims basically reject this violence, just like most Christians would reject lunatic marginal fringes in the United States, just as most Jews would reject the extremist groups on the fringes in Israel. Most Muslims are God-fearing people who want to get on with the business of raising their families and so on. But within the Muslim community and the fundamentalist elements of the Muslim community, you will find these militant organizations, and they are bound and determined to achieve their aims. The one common denominator among these groups is the desire to set up an Islamic state based on Islamic law, the Sharia, based on the Sunnah, the Hadith, and the Quran, going back to the fundamentals, the basics, the essence of Islam. Their image, politically and philosophically, is one that goes back centuries. They do not reject economic modernization. They do not reject technology. They will use that quite happily. But the political and philosophical basis of the system must go back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad and his successors. So they are bound and determined, therefore, to bring down the regimes in the area. Why? Because they are the major impediments to this. And so it is the Algerian regime is under attack Hosni Mubarak in Egypt is under attack, been threatened by assassination attempts. Across the Middle East, there's scarcely any country that goes unthreatened. Even Muammar al-Qaddafi, who sees Arab nationalism as a key motivating force, not religion, will say, my major enemy are the Islamic groups. He has never basically put his hopes on Islam. Islam is a secondary not unimportant, but a secondary matter to him. Until recently, he has seen himself as an Arab nationalist. Now he's an African nationalist. He's going to go that way because he's been in, you know, impeded in, in the Arab world. That's another matter. Gadda even Gaddafi, in our minds, we might say, is in cahoots with these people, is under attack from them. What is the agenda? The agenda, as I said, is to set up Islamic states in the countries in which they're operating. A second agenda that they share to a greater or lesser degree is to eliminate the state of Israel. How many of them will pursue that? A lot of them won't because it's far afield from their primary goal, which is Islamic law, Islamic system, power and control in their own country. But some will engage 
in support of terrorism directed at Israel. A third goal is to reduce, if not eliminate, Western presence, especially American presence, in the Middle East. Some of them are far more committed to that than others. Again, it's a question of your priorities. What does this mean? This means that we are not painting a picture of a monolithic Islamic militant world. And we never have in Washington. Some of the academics, you know, uh, my colleagues would like to create that straw man. But I will tell you that I know no one that deals with the Middle East in the CIA or the DIA or anywhere else that's ever had an image of a monolithic militant Islamic world. Far more sophisticated view. Some groups do threaten American interests, but some don't. So we have to be concerned with those militant Islamic groups that directly or indirectly threaten our interest. But some of them, essentially, we can put on the shelf. An example might be the armed Islamic group in Algeria. As brutal as that group is, essentially it's an Algerian problem, and by extension it's a French problem. And so we tend to stay away from that in any major way. But other groups are of great concern to us. The Al-Qaeda organization of Osama bin Laden, which is basically a transnational terrorist organization, which has decentralized connections with people of like mind is at the forefront of our minds right now. But there are other groups that potentially could cause problems. Now and then Hamas and the Islamic Jihad movement for Palestine make threats against the United States but then they back off. Who is to say in the year 2002 if the peace process is in shambles that they might come out of the woodwork and become such a threat? Certainly Hezbollah has threatened the United States and inflicted great harm our embassy in Beirut, remember, was in ruins long before the embassies in Dar es Salaam and in Nairobi. And Hezbollah did that. Hezbollah has done a lot of bad things. Hezbollah actually in the United States, if you go into New York City, has people that you can locate in a building and you know exactly who they are. But you have to have the right kind of evidence to put them behind bars. But we know who they are. So there are specific militant groups that can cause problems. Why do people join these groups? Because they claim to answer those enduring questions. They, they claim that they can address the problems I talked about. If you lack national cohesion, if you are divided tribally, religiously, and ethnically, join me. Was not the Islamic Ummah one at one time? Were we not all Islamic brothers? Can we not return to the oneness of Islam? Footnote here, of course, that's a di distortion of history from the get-go. Doesn't make any difference. It's what you believe. Come back to God, come back to Islam, and we will be one people. An attractive message. Second, you feel you have an identity crisis? You don't know who you are? Of course you don't know who you are. You cast your lot with the West. You compromised your religion. And what did you get for this, young man, young lady? Nothing. Come back to God. You will find yourself again. You will be engaged in this sublime enterprise of creating his kingdom, in effect, on earth, a return to Sharia Islamic law as the basis of all social, political, and economic activity. Come back to God. Economic stagnation and regression, Islam is the answer. Was not the Islamic empire at its height when the West was in the dark ages until corrupt rulers came along? But we will get rid of the corrupt rulers. Now, obviously, a footnote to this is this is sloganeering. They have not presented any kind of workable program, but they cast it out. And for people who are angry and frustrated and not focused well, it sounds good. Corruption. We know what we do to the corruptors of the earth. They will be taken care of. Participation? Of course. The prophet and his followers always allowed for participation. Is not that not the way that the early followers in Islam, the successors to Muhammad, came to power? They were basically elected among the leaders of the Islamic community. Distortion there? Probably so. But this is powerful message. It says, I can address all of your problems. Join me. So this is where the terrorism comes from. To diminish terrorism over the long haul, these problems have to be addressed. Otherwise, we will continue to face these issues. It doesn't mean that we're going to be able to eradicate it totally. We're playing with percentages here. We've got to make inroads. You can't just have short-term policies 
cops and intelligence to deal with terrorism. We must always remind ourselves about the long-term sources of this in the Middle East. So one issue we have then in the Middle East that generates terrorism is what broadly defined we might call the social, political, economic issue, which I've laid out in terms of these obstacles to achieving our goals, but they're also sources of violence. The second major issue in the Middle East that gives rise to terrorism and that can interconnect with this is, of course, the Arab-Israeli problem. As long as that remains unresolved, and as long as the stagnation remains in the peace process, you will see terrorism. The bad news beyond that is, if we begin to make significant progress for a period of time, you may also see violence, as those who are opposed to a resolution of that conflict come to the fore. We know that the Palestinian groups that are extremist groups, and today's Hamas and the Islamic Jihad movement, have been in the business of this violence for a long time. And they are at the most dangerous when they see the process making headway. We must also remind ourselves that less numerous but equally fanatical groups exist within the state of Israel, in the Jewish community. And so it is within the past month or so, the Shin Bet, the internal security apparatus, has for the first time, the first time in the history of Israel, issued a warning about Jewish militant terrorism. The targets that they worry about are many, but two in particular come to mind. It's Ak Mordecai, who is Minister of Defense, and Bibi Netanyahu. Think about that. He represents the Likud. It's the nationalist side in Israeli politics. Even he is a target. But the veiled threats have been there since he took office, essentially from the really hardline groups. Remember who put you here? Remember what happened to Rabin? These things can happen. And well, what worse person is there than someone who was your ideological blood brother today who would betray you tomorrow? That's as bad as it gets. So Netanyahu himself <coughs> faces that threat. And it's serious. Probably the threat from the Jewish militants would be contained within the Middle East, probably. As for the Palestinians, it's not clear because they have engaged in transnational, international acts of terrorism before. But all bets are off once that gets going. So resolving the Middle East peace process, getting it moving again, is crucial. This week, as you know, they're meeting at the Y Plantation. What may come out of that is a very paltry agreement, quite frankly. They'll give the Palestinians 9% uh, and 3% for a nature reserve and something else, but the major issues will remain unresolved, the kind that Bob Friedman has written eloquently about in your own newspapers here, very wisely about. Refugees. What's going to happen to the refugees? Repatriation, compensation. All of these refugees in camps in the West Bank, in the Gaza, especially across the border in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. That's got to be addressed. What about the issue of security? They dance around that, but how is security to be assured? What about the connected matter of the settlements? How many can stay under whose rule and sovereignty? What about the water? What about the water in the West Bank? What about the water in the Golan Heights? Water in the Golan Heights is believed by many Israeli commentators to be equal, and sometimes they say more important than having the high ground. The sources of the Jordan River, Israel's water, national water carrier, which comes out of the Sea of Galilee, begin up in the Golan. But then we have the aquifers in the West Bank. Who is going to control this vital resource as populations are going up and water is scarce? This is life or death in the Middle East. Oil is not their most important resource in the Middle East. Never has been, never will be. Water is and will be. So this is a crucial matter. What's going to happen with this water? Is that going to be resolved? And then what about the status of the city of Jerusalem? The issue that is usually left to last because it is so difficult. So the major issues, the final status issues so-called, have yet to be addressed in any meaningful way. What you have had so far are incremental agreements that have built some trust that is important. But with the hiatus in the peace talks of the past year or more, we've actually seen backsliding and an erosion of trust. We are now in a damage limitation mode. We are trying to rebuild lost trust. We are not moving forward on the crucial issues. And all of this is conducive to violence and terrorism. So the Middle East is a very troubled place. The violence and the terrorism can come from Islamic militants. It can come from Jewish militants. It can come from ethnic groups. It can come from tribes. The issues will vary. But the challenge is ours because we have vital interest in the Middle East. 
And if nothing else, as we look ahead into the future, we come back to that issue of what kinds of weaponry will be available. One of the leaders of Hamas put it well. He said, and think about it, think back to the newspapers. We began with knives. Remember the stabbings of Israeli soldiers and civilians. And then we went to machine guns. And then we went to bombs. And now we are working on new things. What are the new things? Anthrax, botulism, radiological devices. There are right now technical and political obstacles to using those. Who is to say that the technical obstacles cannot be overcome? You would have to be a bold person. 25 years ago, if I were to try to describe to you, and I couldn't have described to you the email and the internet, you'd probably glazed over. It's unimaginable. Think of the technical obstacles in creating that. And so you can't figure out a way to dispense anthrax, botulism, VX. These things will be overcome. Are they are going to be used necessarily as weapons of mass destruction? I want to close on this note. In the media, it is portrayed often as weapons of mass destruction. We're going to basically fly light aircraft around the city of Baltimore and kill 500,000 people here. You might be able to do that. But I think the greater likelihood is what I would call weapons of selective destruction. Selective destruction. That's the one to me that is more realistic because it will not involve fratricide. Essentially what we're saying is doing it on the cheap and doing it in a smaller way. Give you an example. Remember in Tel Aviv, where almost predictably they went from bombing buses and leaving bombs in various places to going into a shopping mall. Those were conventional explosives, and yet the damage was significant. What if someday the Hamas operativity from the Isidine al Qassam brigades or whatever decides he's going in with one of these chemical or biological agents, and all he wants to really do is kill three or four hundred people and leave an awful lot of people sick and in misery. Think of the magnifying effect of that. When the media, this is going to be the media story of our time, and then the fear will spread. That is the issue with terrorism, it is fear. You don't have to kill hundreds of thousands of people, but you can create hundreds of thousands of fearful people. If I can use an example with regard to American power projection capability, we have a couple of points that we use to sustain our military forces abroad to support a surge capability. As you know, fighting a war like we did in the Gulf or anywhere requires lots of support and supplies. How could you shut those two or three places down? Chemical, biological. How many of you and most of the people who support the surge are civilians? How many want to go to work tomorrow right over there if it's contaminated with biological and chemical agents? So you see, you don't have to kill lots of people. And that's where I tend to part company in a limited way from some of my colleagues. They tend, and I agree with them, to be worried about weapons of mass destruction. I do not dismiss that. I consider it a serious problem. But I'd like to throw into the equation weapons of selective destruction, killing smaller numbers of people, but generating enormous amounts of fear that go way beyond the act. Terrorists, if I can figure this out, my friends, terrorists can. These kinds of things have happened before. We said airplanes could not sink battleships. We said it's kind of alarmist and hysterical to say that terrorists would start to bomb huge buildings like this. Come on, you know, that's, why? Because we are mirror imaging. We find, as Americans coming out of our culture, these things are particularly heinous acts. Who would do such a thing? And yet, in our times, it's all happened. And in Oklahoma City, of course, it was one of our own people. Doesn't mean that the Arab suspects who've done it before shouldn't have been on that suspects list. You have your usual suspects, and now we add more. We own our own, add our own people. It's not either or. We're going into a very uncertain century where we're going to have some really insidious means of violence. This is what we are concerned about. In a nutshell, it means what? In terms of the short-term problems, it means intelligence. It means police work. It means international cooperation among intelligence agencies and police, just as we've seen in the bin Laden case. These things are imperative. It means interagency support and cooperation in Washington. 
It means preparations that involve national, local, and state officials in case a bad incident happens. People are trained to respond effectively. We've got a huge agenda. We are starting to get on with it, but we've got miles to go and promises to keep on that score. But we have now understood the magnitude of the threat. It's a very difficult situation. Again, yes, the possibility and the probability may be low, but how do you really know? But what if it happens? The consequences will be too great, so we need to prevent it. We have to address long-term problems of the sort I talked about and then do these short-term things and hope that we are successful. And a lot of the terrorism, but not all, will emanate from the Middle East. It is probably the most difficult place to deal with in the world. I wish I could uh, set the stage for your dinners later tonight by saying happier things, but uh, <laughs> quite frankly, I don't see much to be happy about in the Middle East right now. So with those introductory remarks, let me back off and respond to anything in particular that you're interested in with regard to the Middle East. Thank you for that, uh, that wonderful framework, not wonderful in the sense of complete. The um, floor is open for questions. Dr. Heron's uh, question uh, is an observation, but a question. Why are not uh, functional institutions uh, more widely created in the Middle East, uh, such as the ones that have seemed to stabilize uh, Europe? I think when it comes to <clears throat> the Western experience, we have tended to have the luxury of at least some time in dealing with major issues like national cohesion, economic problems, distribution of economic wealth and so on, political participation. It's been, we had our wars and our conflicts. We've worked it out in a up and down way, but we've had time to work through it. In the Middle East, they face all of these problems simultaneously. And while they face them, they are in a culture of profound distrust. There is no single, you know, it, whatever its failings, and there were many, one of the things the church did in the Middle East, religion did, or, or in, the, in Europe rather, was to put an end to chronic almost anarchy and violence. It's, it was guilty of its own sins, but a lot of the violence was reduced. In the Middle East, there are major religions and ethnic groups that cannot provide one sort of central point that you can build on. They are in conflict. They distrust one another. So when it comes to then a specific matter, like a rational program for sharing water resources, you run into deep distrust. And we can point to possible solutions, but they don't trust one another. And that's one of the reasons the multilateral negotiations on water have gone nowhere, and even the bilaterals are stuck in the mud. You can't get beyond the distrust. The Turks distrust the Syrians, the Syrians distrust the Turks, the Iraqis distrust both the Syrians and the Turks, the Israelis, the Jews distrust the Arabs, the Egyptians distrust the Sudanese, they distrust the Ethiopians and the Eritreans because that's where the water starts. They are very attuned to all of this business. Who is going to give in? Who is going to accept the first compromising step? When that step is going to be with an age-old adversary and leaders on the other side that eyeball to eyeball in an area of the world where personal connections are so crucial, you simply don't trust. That's the problem. It's a good idea, but it's hard to do, hard to operationalize. Uh, can you comment on the American policy towards Saddam Hussein? <clears throat> I would say policy right now is to contain him within a narrow box. We feel that his wings have been clipped, but we need to keep a careful eye on him. There is one caveat in all of this, and that is if we think he's getting anywhere near regenerating his capacity to create weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, nuclear, and a delivery capability. As long as he's not moving in that direction, in many ways he is the victim of self-inflicted wounds. It is very easy to say, as Scott Ritter would and some others, the United States ought to face him down. But if you step back from this, and look at what's gone on in the latest go-round. Saddam has shot himself in the foot. What he was banking on were the British, the Chinese, and the Russians continuing to weigh in and to find, quote, creative solutions in, in the UN and elsewhere that would erode the sanctions. That's his objective in the midterm, get the sanctions lifted. And he's been on again, off again with diplomatic efforts, with uh, military shadow boxing, and so on. 
What he's done this time is essentially say to the UNSCOP people, you can't come and inspect. Well, you cannot lift the sanctions unless you do the inspections to certify that he's clean. So he has basically made it impossible to certify and to inspect. So he's really done us a huge favor at this point. That's how I read it. Now, the longer term question is, what about the problem in Iraq? I'm one of those who believe, there are some who believe, and there's an article just recent, over the last year in Middle East policy that says, why don't we break, in effect, Iraq down into four constituent states? It really is an artificial entity. That's a little dicey. I'm one who believes that the center of gravity, and I've, I see there's an article recently in Survival on this, but this has been a long personal belief of mine. The center of gravity, those resources that if they're destroyed, you're finished, is the one that involves Saddam and his security forces broadly defined. All of the secret police forces, the Republican guards, the special Republican guards, Saddam's commandos, these are the essential ingredients. If you really want to get to Saddam, this is what you must go after. As a consequence of that, it is my feeling that if there is a showdown, and it's a military showdown, there should be a sustained and systematic bombing campaign directed at all assets and facilities directed, uh, connected with his control mechanism. This is the only feasible way to get at this guy. So I'm not one who basically says, well, Saddam is a problem that's gone away. We've got him contained. In the long term, we may have to deal with him. And if we have to deal with him, I give you my opinion, our focus should be on his control apparatus. I think this potentially could do him the most damage. Would you comment upon groups or forces uh, within Middle Eastern countries that would serve as a counterbalance to the terrorist groups which you've described? Well, first let's uh, focus on coercive groups. Certainly the uh, intelligence and security agencies in various Middle Eastern countries are very attuned to this. So they are the first line of defense. Having said that, one of the difficulties is that very often they are ill-disciplined and they create more enemies than they eliminate. This is a potential problem, for example, in Egypt, where they have dragooned people off the streets and thrown them into jail who are in the Muslim Brotherhood. People in the Muslim Brotherhood, they probably have nothing to do with the Jama'ah or the Islamic Jihad. To the extent that you contain the problem in the short term by doing that, uh, you may be happy, but in the long term, you may have built a larger underground. So, first of all, police and security apparatuses, but operating within a disciplined context. Beyond that, are there forces in society? Yes, there certainly are. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, functional groups in society, intellectual groups and so on, that realize that recourse to terrorism is counterproductive. The government can mobilize them. I think very importantly within that framework would be the mainstream Muslim teachers, the ulama, the teachers of Islam. Uh, you can, if you're in Egypt, for example, try to mobilize the spokesman from the Al-Hazar, the great learning center for Islam in that country, but across the Middle East. What you try to do is mobilize what we would consider the non-militant Islamic groups, both liberal and fundamentalist. There are a lot of fundamentalist Muslims that want no part of the violence. And I think if I were to be dealing with this and I was looking for or looking at a society and trying to pick out groups that would be the most effective those are the ones that I would try to zero in on the religious groups that have influence on a day-by-day -day basis and try to cultivate them if I were the government so yes I, in a shorthand manner I would say there are groups in the Middle East of various sorts that can be used to try to blunt and marginalize the Islamic militants and I think so far there has been reasonable success in doing that. The question is for the future. If all of those enduring problems are not resolved, will this become, over time, a futile effort? Time will, and history will judge that. The question is, uh, how do we respond uh, uh, to bombings such as the recent ones in our, uh, against our em embassies in Africa without making the situation worse? Well, I think <clears throat> what you need is to treat this not in a sort of an episodic manner, but rather with a national strategy that uses all the instruments at your disposal, that from the outset focuses on aggressive diplomacy, multilaterally, bilaterally, coercive diplomacy, 
against the people who support them, economic measures of various sorts, not just directed by way of sanctions uh, at the supporters of these groups or at the groups, but also economic carrots to entice people to basically turn tail and undermine these groups and betray them. Thirdly, public information campaigns. Uh, this is very important, to get the word out. A former ambassador to Iraq, a very astute observer, came back last year and said to me, we are losing the information war in the Middle East. He calls it the image war. He said, we're still not very good at that. We need, in the Middle East and elsewhere, to make sure that our information campaigns are effective in depicting this for what it is, brutal attacks on civilians. We're making headway with that. Coupled with that, public diplomacy. That is to say, diplomacy uh, that uses public information internationally and, and in this country here. What do I have in mind? A very positive step forward a couple of weeks ago. If you read the President's speech at the United Nations, you have an example of excellent public diplomacy, one that we have passed out to our students when we get involved in this. He said the right things. He pushed the right buttons. He could have said waffled things, but he stood before the international community and he painted the picture of terrorism and what it meant. And he basically said, this isn't just an American problem. This is our problem. But he didn't leave it at that. He then went around the, the General Assembly and he said, it's a Sri Lankan problem, it's an Egyptian problem, it's that problem. He made people feel that it was their problem. But what was he referring to? Terrorism inside their borders. And essentially, this is just one more step to try to mobilize support internationally because in the end, if you're going to clip the wings of these guys, you need international cooperation, police and security. It's crucial. So you want that arrow you know, in your arsenal. And then, of course, militarily, you need various special forces, Delta forces, special forces of SEALs and this and that to deal with specific incidents. You need a military capability to punish and deter if necessary. And this is an area that I think has not been fully uh, thought through. And I would personally argue we need to go back and look at some of the Cold War literature about nuclear deterrence. Not because the situation is the same, it's obviously very different, but the concepts, what makes for effective deterrence? Do we need declaratory policies that are clear? Do you have the capability to carry out the actions you threaten? We need to do that. So when I'm thinking of a strategy, I'm thinking of all the instruments of policy at our disposal. Diplomacy, economics, positive and negative, informational campaigns, use of the military in various ways and in appropriate ways, orchestrated over a long term by the administration, not with a magic wand to eliminate terrorism, that's unrealistic, but rather to reduce it, to contain it. So I'm looking at this from a national strategic perspective. Specific attacks, in some cases, may be counterproductive, as you suggest. In other cases, it's hard to tally it up. It could very well be the case that the attacks in Afghanistan and in the Sudan actually had a positive effect. It put people on notice of one thing. The United States has had it with this kind of behavior. So whether or not you eliminated much of bin Laden's infrastructure is not as important as basically saying to everyone out there, if you think you're going to do this, you're not going to get away scot-free. We will find you, locate you, and attack you. But let me say this, the centerpiece, the centerpiece of this in the short term as we deal with it is not the military. The critical ingredients are the security agencies and intelligence community. Intelligence community, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at State, and so on. They must cooperate. Think about it. If I have information and I don't share it with you, and the event goes down, what went wrong? Why didn't you share it? Why, why this bureaucratic stovepiping? So we're really trying to move away from that. And the second thing would be cooperation amongst police forces, whether it's Scotland Yard, special police in Rwanda, whether it are the police in India. What are we finding? Take a look at what's going on with our friend bin Laden. We are picking up his people around the world, getting amazing cooperation as a result of our strategy. We're beginning to have an impact here. Doesn't mean he won't strike tomorrow, but better he, you know, strike one time than ten times. If we can get most of his people off the street, we're going to be better off. So I don't have a panacea, 
But what I suggest is a national strategy and end up saying it's got to really be focused on police and intelligence work. That is so crucial that we do that right, to stop it before it happens. This is an easy problem. This is going to take a lot of hard work by a lot of people. The question was at first cut, how about a W... At first cut, the question would be, how about a WPA project for uh, Palestinians? Meaning, wouldn't encouragement of economic uh, improvements uh, tend to dampen the problem and uh, uh, force the terrorists, if anything, to act against their own? But I'm going to let you uh, ferret Not out what you... Uh, <laughs> Challenging question, what? but an uh, excellent question. Um, I think it goes back to our discussion of those long-term factors. This is the kind of thing, in a broader sense, going beyond the Palestinians that needs to be done. Some people envisage a Marshall Plan for the Middle East when you put it on a grand scale. However, having said that, you must have the structural conditions and the cultural attitudes that will make it possible. It's one thing to do that in Europe and quite another to do it in the Middle East as things presently stand. If we narrow it down to the Palestinian community, yes, this is a point that has been made as in an attempt to reduce terrorism over the long term and essentially to foster I hmm? heard it yes no money has come from Europe and others not a WPA program but to to help in infuse the Palestinian economy here is the problem the money that is being sent and being made available in terms of foreign aid runs up against bureaucratic obstacles <laughs> who's getting it who's using it for what one of the crit criticisms of the Palestine National Authority made by Palestinians is that the leaders in this end up not using it for the economic projects that they were supposed to, but rather using it to build very nice villas overlooking the Mediterranean. So essentially it's business as usual. It is corruption, it's bureaucratic stagnation, it is political authoritarianism, all of which makes it difficult to use money effectively. But not just in the Palestinian arena, but also in places like Egypt and so on. It's a good idea in theory. It is very difficult to implement in practice. Let, let, uh, obviously, we, uh, we thank our guests for an absolutely wonderful evening. <laughs>